Hello. Uh, are we on? Are we live? Rob and Andrea, give me a thumbs up or a uh, text that uh, we're good. Hello? Am I on live now? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, everybody. Good morning. Um, we uh, are preparing for our service this morning. And again, uh, Pastor Jan and I will be conducting this. We, uh, as always, we're going to start with the reading of the word. We're going to pray into the word this morning. Uh, and as you know from the previous Sundays, if you've watched, I have uh, been reading the psalm each morning that corresponds to the actual day of the year. I started doing that uh, several Tuesdays ago when uh, on the 91st day of 2020, I read Psalm 91. Today is the 117th day of the year. Uh, Pastor Jan will be using Psalm 117 for the communion service. So I am going to pray into Psalm 116 yesterday, uh, yesterday's reading, yesterday's date, which is a powerful, powerful psalm. I'm going to read it out of the NIV. I love the Lord for he hear, heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. Lord, we uh, come before you this day hear our cry, hear our cry for mercy, not only for ourselves, but for others as well, Lord, in the name of Jesus. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. Lord, we know that there are many right now uh, who have actually entered into death, Lord. Uh, they've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And Lord, there are others of us, we're alive, but we feel the anguish of the grave coming over us. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, deliver us, deliver our city, deliver our region, deliver our state, deliver our brothers and sisters in New York City, deliver our brothers and sisters in New Jersey, and deliver our brothers and sisters, Lord, all over this nation and all over the earth. Lord, save. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. Uh, Lord, uh, the, the Lord protects those who are unaware. The Lord protects those who are simple, Lord God, even not fully understanding and coming to grips with what you're doing in this hour, Lord. You protect us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. We return to our rest, Lord, not because circumstances have met our desires, Lord, but because you have been good to us. Let us experience your goodness, your graciousness. It's the goodness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. May we walk before you, Lord, in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I'm greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. And Lord, in our affliction, we're, we're embracing so 
so many conspiracy theories, so many far out views of what's going on, so many so-called prophetic words uh, that this is what this is and this is what that is. And we can come to the place where in our frustration, we say everyone is a liar, but we do know, Lord, let everyone be a liar, but let God be true. When shall I return to the Lord? What shall I return? What shall I give to the Lord in return for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Lord, we lift up the cup of deliverance, Lord. Your name, Yeshua, means Yahweh delivers, the Lord delivers. And Father, we lift up that cup of deliverance. We call on your name. We fulfill your vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, Lord. Lord, our vow is that we will have faith in you, that we will have trust in you, Lord. We our, our vow is that in our hearts, we are completely certain that the God who promises will fulfill his promise. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. And Lord, I want to pause and just remember brothers and sisters who've gone home to be with the Lord. I've known pastors, bishops who are my friend, ministers of the Lord, elders, your people who have gone home to be with the Lord. And we just have to acknowledge, Lord, that while we sorrow, while we struggle with these issues, precious in your sight is the death of your saints, your faithful servants, Lord. Lord, we welcome them into your presence and we pray for comfort, Lord. Comfort for the families, comfort for the loved ones, comfort for the friends, comfort for the churches that have lost faithful servants, precious family members, spiritually and, and, and natural families. I serve you just as my mother did. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. You have freed me from my chains. And we are your servants. We are your saints. Free us from our chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. And today, Lord, as we gather together as the body of Christ, though we're not in a, a single physical location, we are one in the spirit, Lord. And we are one in the spirit with the communion of the saints, those saints that have gone before us, including those who have lost their lives in this pandemic and those who have gone before us years and years ago. Precious saints, Lord God, mothers and fathers in the faith. Pastor Bruce Todd, Brother Jim Murphy, Brother Jim Johnston, our sister Sue Silva, Lord, those who have gone before us in the Lord, our sister Maggie Fuchs, Lord, those who have gone before us, Lord, we are not in the same physical location, but we are one with the communion of the saints. So even though we're not in the same physical location, inhabitants, Lord, we declare that we are in the presence of your people. We are in the courts of the house of the Lord. We are in the midst of Jerusalem. And together we say, praise the Lord in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Jan for the Lord's Supper. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Every day is like a Sunday. Every day is like a Monday. Every day is like a Tuesday. But happy Sunday morning to you. Um, I, I want to say, uh, I, first I want to start out with the scripture. Uh, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. You know, last week I talked about three things that you need to do. Um, always be reading the word. It says right in scripture, it's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. I need the word of God. 
I need the word of God in my head to stop those thoughts of depression, to, to, to fight the enemies in my mind. I need the word of God. The second thing I said was you need to pray and praise the Lord. You need to have that fellowship with him. You need to know him. You need him. You need to know him to be able to fight your enemies. And the last thing, if you have those two things, then you must walk in righteousness. You must. Christians that don't aren't showing Jesus to the world. So saying that, please read the word. And I like what Pastor has been doing, so I've been doing it. I read a psalm a day. So today is 117. So if you want to look in your Bible at that. The interesting thing about this 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 psalm, um, you know, when I was thinking about what was I going to share today, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll do the psalm that's for today. And it when I looked at it, I was... Sadly disappointed because it is two verses. That's it, two verses. And I thought to myself, how am I going to ever get anything out of that? Two verses. But I want to tell you that anytime you read the Word of God, you could write volumes on one word in his sentence. And we know sitting under a pastor, he will take literally a line in Revelations and teach for years on that. So we do know that. In the Word of God, there are hidden treasures. And some people, like my husband, who I think is part theologian, can weave things together, weave things in and out, bring this scripture to that scripture, and paint an incredible tapestry. I don't have that gift, but I still have the ability to go deeper um, and find some things that are awesome in the Word of God. So when let me first read this very short chapter. Um, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. Laud him, all ye peoples. For his mercy, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endures forever. I'm going to read it one more time since it's so short. Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. Laud him, all ye peoples. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. So when I discovered how short it was, I did a little research, found out that it is the shortest psalm, which you probably all know. It is the shortest chapter in the Bible, which you probably can guess. But one thing, and, and you know, maybe this will be disputed by my husband, I don't know. I didn't even run it by him yet. But... It is dead center in the book. It is in the middle. It is the center of the Bible. Close, he says. The last song. Oh, right. well, anyway, it's somewhere between 116 and 117, but for my purposes today, we're going to say it's 117. And isn't that interesting? Why would the Lord put this psalm in the middle? Why? We know that God does everything for a reason. There is nothing that has happened. He tells us, you know, he, he, he knows how many hair we have on our head. He knows how many sparrows drop to the ground. He knows everything. So why would he place this short, short, short psalm in the middle? Interesting, isn't it? And the very first line is, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. Well, what does that mean? I'm a Gentile, right? You're a Gentile, maybe. I don't know. Maybe you're uh, uh, you're Jewish. I don't know. What he is saying is all people, all people, praise the Lord, all people. And then he says, praise him, all ye peoples, all people. You know, if we go back from the center and go back, it leads us to the garden the beginning of all for, for mankind. And in that garden, God's intent was what? To um, make sure that we all praised him, that all nations loved him, that all men knew him, correct? 
So from that, we go backwards, and, and if you ever read history, you know sometimes you have a starting point and you go back to see what built up to this point. So here we are now. We know from the garden till this psalm, a lot has happened. There's been a lot of wars, a lot of division, and God's heart is still that all people would praise him. And then we go from this point to the future. It leads us. If we go to the very last book of the Bible, to Revelation, and if we look at Revelation 21, it says, um, I'm just going to turn to it. And now I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Wow. So the beginning, you know, um, I always teach my kids in school, you can have a circular Conclusion, beginning, how I start is how I end. And I think God, that was his ultimate purpose, that we would always be one. We would always be one. So he started that, that thought in the garden, and he ended, we're all together praising him, in the kingdom, in the new heaven. That's incredible. So when you think about how God orchestrates everything in our lives, there's, there's nothing that's an accident. And so everything in our lives has purpose. It might not always seem like it, and it might be hard, and it might be heartbreaking, but it has purpose. It has from If you think about where you were in the past, how you were in the past, unsaved, sinner, God, God cleaned you up, got you on his path, that's incredible. And then you think about, wow, where is that leading me? Where will God take me? What will be the end of my story? We can't stay in our heads. We cannot. We must read the word. We must be in fellowship with God. And right now, during this lockdown time, we can't fellowship with each other one-on-one. -on -one, but you can do FaceTime and you can do um phone calls and um there there are ways that we can share with if we really want to the sad part is we are not meeting as a church physical church but we're still trying to maintain um our, our church family and outside of that family um you know i was talking to someone yesterday and i said you know Americans, not all Americans, I know there are many Americans that suffer, really. They live in, in, in poverty. But for the majority of us that are watching this live cast, um, we live very comfortably. We live in um, middle, middle America. And when we gripe, about our circumstances. I think about the families in Africa that don't have a house, can't just quarantine themselves and have all the necessities at their fingertips. I think of poor people in India or Pakistan who are being beheaded. If they thought they only had a quarantine and they would be fine, they would probably laugh at us, I think. We have so much we have so much it's really shame on us for complaining about any of this right now because we still can maintain a life we still are relatively safe but there are people in our country as there are poor people in every country that are struggling more than we are so we we need to pray for them and we need to really stop complaining i just want to end now with the last verse for his merciful kindness is great toward us. Think about that. His merciful kindness. His mercy. His kindness. 
is great towards us. If you read this scripture all day and memorized it, that should just flood your mind. And any misconceptions you have should go away. His merciful kindness is great. And the truth of the Lord endures forever. So there's two things in this psalm that we need to always remember. His merciful kindness and his truth endures forever. His internal truth is his faithfulness to complete what he has started, within, which includes salvation for everyone. So we look at the beginning. He wanted fellowship with Adam and Eve. He wanted that to spread to all mankind. And there was a glitch in the program. There was a glitch in the problem. But he ends. We know he's victorious. He knows that his people that love him and follow him will be victorious. We see. We, we, we are spoilers. We go to the end of the book and we read what happens. So wherever you are in your life, whether you're at midpoint or past midpoint, don't lose hope. Don't think that you're surrounded by enemies because you are not. And remember the scriptures say we fight an invisible enemy. Isn't that funny that that's what um, President Trump calls the coronavirus right now? It's an invisible enemy. But scripture tells us we've always been fighting an invisible enemy, always. So. We just need to um, really think about how great our God is. How great our God is. I, I, I think I, if you read one Psalm 147, it talks about his greatness. You can open anywhere in, in the book and you will find out how great he is. How great he is. He says he will never leave us nor forsake us. The truth of the Lord endures forever. The truth will overcome obstacles. The truth will clean out the clutter in your mind. The truth. You know, I suffer from depression. I can't let my mind go there. I cannot allow it to go there. And in this hour, people maybe that never experienced depression before are finding out that they're very down, they are depressed. We have tools, we have equipment, we have something so powerful to get us out of depression. Depression is not allowed in the kingdom of God. When you get there, you're not gonna see a room full of people being depressed. It doesn't exist. So prepare for it now. When you feel that overcoming, read the word. Read the word. Fellowship with Jesus. Sing songs. There is no room for depression. And I know I have to fight it. It isn't like, oh, yeah, she's just saying that. No, she's not just saying that. And what Robin Williams did was absolutely wrong. 100% wrong. There was no reason. He took a permanent solution to a temporary problem. He did not read the word. He did not fellowship with Jesus. And he did not have the church. And he did not walk in righteousness. We cannot go there. Please don't go there. There is no reason for that. Never. So, saying that, I just want to know that this psalm is actually a global invitation to Gentiles and Jews, all people of the earth. This is a global invitation. It, Jesus doesn't was he just wasn't for the Jews. He was from he was for everyone. So he wants to take us back to look all the glorious things he did for us. Think back. Yeah, there were a lot of things I did that were wrong. There were maybe some things that people did that offended me, but yet created me, helped to create this person. God uses everything it's that scripture says for his good. So where I'm at right now, it's Psalm 117. I like to think that I'm centered in Jesus. I'm centered on the word. 
I'm working really hard um, to make good choices. And I'm relying on Jesus to help me to be free from the past of my mind depression. And, and I know, I know what I need to do. I know. And when we allow ourselves to go places where we shouldn't, it's willful. It is willful. And God wants us to break free of those things, repent from those things, and move forward. We must repent. We cannot stay in those places. We cannot stay. It will destroy us. It will destroy us and the people around us. So that's all I want to share today. Again, remember thy word is a lamp unto my feet. We'd probably say like a flashlight nowadays. And the light unto my path. The word is huge. It opens up the darkness. It divides the darkness. So we can walk in light. Do not, do not, do not leave the word out of your life. And if you just even do what Pastor was doing and now I'm doing it, read the psalm a day. So tomorrow is Psalm 118. But I wouldn't just read it once. Now see, what I'll do tonight is read it before I fall asleep. And then I'll read it tomorrow. And then I'll read it tomorrow. And then I'll read it tomorrow. And then tomorrow night I'll read the next days. So it sort of prepares me for the next day. But it also gets me, um, hopefully it gives me rest and peace during the night. So um, we're going to partake in communion now. I, I, um, I hope really during this time you're all, you're all hanging in there. Um, I really do. I, I really hope that um, you're praying more, you're reading the word more. You know, if God set this time aside for us, then let's make the most of it, right? So we're going to do communion now. And um, so whatever you are partaking in, I got a couple interesting emails last week, one from Hadassah saying she was having an Oreo cookie, and I forget what she was drinking. Um, someone else said they were eating some sort of cracker I never heard of before. So whatever you're partaking in for communion, it's it's fine. It's great. Because what we're doing is we're remembering um, the Lord Jesus in what he did for us. You know, I was really, I was thinking last night about his death and how horrible it was. And I was thinking about on both sides of him, he was, um, he was crucified with the guilty. He was there in the middle of two men that, that had committed a crime. But here Jesus, the Lamb of God, did not commit any crime ever. Not one sin, as scripture says, ever. But here he was, this horrible, horrible, horrible death in the middle of, of criminals. And I think about that. You know, he was unjustly found guilty of something he didn't do. All he did was proclaim to be God, and that's what why he was crucified. But if we think about that, there's many times we're going to be falsely accused. If we're walking in Jesus, we will be falsely accused of things. People don't want to hear about Jesus. A lot of people don't. Some people do. And they're out there. We just have to spread the word and um, find the lost and bring them to Jesus. So um, I'm going to pray now. I want you really this week to think about everything you have, everything that God has given you. And then imagine for one minute you didn't have any of that. And God picked you up and moved you to Africa right now where they're fighting locusts and the coronavirus. And they don't have a house like you have and food available at grocery store. And God picked you up and moved you there. I really want us to think about why was I born in America? Why, why was I blessed to live with everything I need?
when there are other people in the world that aren't, that weren't. So I really think that we need to, you know, really stop um, complaining, I guess I should say, and I'm guilty of it, of all the conveniences, of all the things that God has given me through my life. So Jesus, you are amazing. I think more amazing than we understand, more amazing than we realize. We complain. Americans, I think, I don't know. I don't know if we complain more than any other people group on the, on the planet, but I know we complain. We complain we can't go here. We complain we can't go there. We complain that, you know, this happened and that happened. We're always complaining about something. I pray that we stop, that what comes out of our mouth would not be, would be good things, not ugliness. I pray that what comes out of our mouth is repentance, that we, we stop and get on our knees and turn back from those mind screws that play with us. I pray for repentance for your people, dear God, that they would thank you every day. The first thing they do when they get out of their bed is thank you for being God. For thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, for being great. That your merciful kindness endures forever. That your truth endures forever. Hallelujah, Jesus. Bless what we are going to partake. Because it is in remembrance of you that we do this. It is in remembrance of your greatness your goodness, your faithfulness, your truth. May today be a turning point for some of us. May tomorrow be a turning point. May we turn to you and not our own thoughts because our own thoughts are not going to save us, are not going to bring make us whole, are not going to deliver us from our afflictions. It is you and your word. So in Jesus, thank you again for all that you have done. Thank you so much, Jesus, for what we are going to partake. Amen. Well, again, Pastor is um, prepared my meal, another tostita chip. Um, I did ask my daughters to get us some crackers, so they are shopping for us. So maybe next week I'll surprise you with a cracker. Thank you, old guy. Though I don't, I, I'm not being flippant. I'm just knowing that you don't care what we eat, Lord. Thank you for thank you for providing for us. <coughs> okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for <clears throat> watching me not choke. Have a blessed day. And here comes um, the theologian. <laughs> Always a joke. Don't joke. Okay, we are back. Last week, I started the series that I want to do on mountain moving faith. We looked at Zechariah chapter 4 and Zechariah chapter 14 as a background, Jewish background, Hebrew scriptural background to Jesus' sayings in the New Testament about having mountain-moving faith. Now in the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, four times Jesus makes reference to uh, what we would consider mountain-moving faith. Uh, he speaks of having mountain-moving faith in Matthew 17:20. He speaks of mountain moving faith in Mark 11:23, Matthew 21:21, 21, 21, and then 
a related saying is sycamore tree moving faith, which is in Luke 17, uh, verses 1 through 6. Jesus talks about uh, uprooting a sycamore tree with faith and, and planting it into the sea. Uh, whereas in the other instances, he talks about saying to a mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. Uh, we will look more at the specific details in each passage, um, perhaps next week. What I want to do is, is give an, an overview of mountain moving faith. Uh, I would say that this is a, a pertinent word for the situation we're finding ourselves in. We need mountain moving faith. A reminder of scriptures that Pastor Bird mentioned last week, I've quoted them. In Hebrews 11, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So mountain moving faith is obviously something that is necessary to please God. Now, there's faith for miracles. There's faith for salvation and deliverance. There's faith for revelation. Uh, we're looking at all of these different ideas and concepts tied into these four mountain moving faith sayings of Jesus. Now, to give us the background um, uh, from last week and also to set the stage for this week and the following week, I'm gonna be uh, looking at some things that came from a book by Maureen Jung. That's Y-E-U-N-G. And the title of the book is Faith in Jesus and Paul. And she uh, has a section uh, where she starts in on looking at Jesus's mountain moving faith perspectives. One of the things that we have to remember about mountains, and I'm, I'm gonna um, look at something that uh, Terrence Donaldson uh, said, uh, Donaldson, uh, wrote a book called Jesus on the Mountain, a study in uh, Matthew's theology. And he uses this, this idea of a mountain uh, as, as it's uh, used in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, actually, there are seven unnamed mountains uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, but the mountains that we see, mountains uh, hold... Um, spiritual significance uh, in scripture. You have, particularly in the New Testament, you have a number of mountains that are, are mentioned. There's the Temple Mountain, Mount Zion, of course, uh, and, and Zion itself, the term became a shorthand for the temple. The temple itself was built on a mountain. Uh, adjacent to the, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem was the Mount of Olives, which of course is the mountain uh, that Jesus ascended from in Luke and Acts. Uh, Mount of Olives is, is mentioned in Zechariah 14, which we looked at uh, last week. And it's, it's mentioned numerous times in the New Testament, as well as the Temple Mount or the, the mountain in Jerusalem. Uh, you also have a uh, potentially up to three other mountains, as well as mountain ranges uh, listed in the Gospels. Mount Hermon, which is uh, oftentimes seen as the location of the Transfiguration. Mount Tabor, Mount Meron. Mount Meron was the largest mountain. It's not named uh, per se in the Gospels, but it may be referred to because uh, the seven mountains that, that Matthew discusses in his gospel, they're all unnamed mountains. And for the most part, the mountains or the, the hill country or the mountain ranges are also unnamed uh, in the New Testament. Mount Sinai, of course, was the place where the Lord descended uh, to give the children of Israel uh, the law, the covenant, the Ten Commandments. It's where he met with Moses. His glory came on the mountain and established his uh, covenant relationship with the children of Israel having departed from Egypt. The seven unnamed mountains in Matthew, uh, I'm just going to list the verse references. 
uh, we will actually be looking uh, at several of the mountains that I've already named uh, in these four passages. But Matthew lists a high mountain that Satan took Jesus up upon to show him all the kingdoms of the earth in Matthew 4, verse 8, which may be a literal mountain. It may have been some kind of a supernatural transportation. It might, it, it, it may be a single mountain being symbolic of a, of a spiritual reality, but that's Matthew 4, verse 8. We call that the mountain of the temptation. In Matthew 5, verse 1, Jesus ascended a mountain to preach the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 14, 23 and 15, 29, Jesus ascends uh, various uh, uh, hill country places uh, to minister to Jew and Gentile uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. The Mount of Transfiguration is uh, Matthew 17, verse 1, and that, of course, is one of the four um, passages that deals with mountain moving faith. In 24, verse 3 of Matthew, it's the it's it, Jesus uh, ascends the Mount of Olives and prophesies the destruction of the temple. And finally, in 28, 16, Jesus, post resurrection, summons his disciples to a mountain in Galilee and gives them the Great Commission. Now, let me read a little bit from Maureen Jung here. Um, Jung talks about the fact that mountains hold uh, significance uh, in Scripture. She says, uh, Jesus refers to literal mountains in the Gospels. The point to note uh, that whichever mountain is referred to are no ordinary mountains. All of them together with Mount Sinai are regarded as, and she has in quotations, holy mountains in the Jewish biblical tradition and are often associated with the revelation of God or God's eschatological actions. An eschatological action means a, a final action of the Lord. We, we mentioned the previous two weeks is the Lord deconstructs and reconstructs. He ends and then he makes a new beginning. And, and uh, eschatology has to do with the fact that God ends things and begins things. The book of Revelation, the Lord ends uh, the, the heavens uh, that the, the human life functions under and brings the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, in the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Lord ends uh, an, an old covenant way of living and begins a new covenant way. In fact, when, when we, we need to understand eschatology, and mountains are part of that, mountains always symbolize that. We need to understand eschatology is the fact that the, whenever the Lord does something to put an end to one way of existence and begin a new way, that is an eschatological act. Many people are waiting for the book of Revelation to have a future fulfillment. Uh, the book of Revelation was fulfilled uh, around the time it was prophesied. Uh, it was prophesied three and a half years before the destruction of Jerusalem, and the word says very clearly, these things must shortly come to pass, and they did. It doesn't mean that that the book of Revelation has no significance for us. The book of Revelation then becomes a model of how God ends things and begins things. I, I, I would posit that the Lord has done this and he's repeated this through history. Uh, there, he, he puts an end to a certain way of doing things and he starts a new way of doing things. And that's consistent with what eschatological revelation is. It's not like we're, 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 we're waiting for some, some final conclusion where the book of Revelation can be fulfilled. In Acts, when the Spirit was poured out, the Lord was putting an end to, to, to one way of relating to God's covenant and starting a new one. It took place on Pentecost. Pentecost for the Jews at that time was the giving of the law, where God came down on the Mount of Sinai and gave the law to his people to establish what would be the parameters, how would his covenant relationship with them be carried out. Well, here we have a Pentecost 
you know, flash forward some 14, 1500 years later. Now on this Pentecost, God gives a new kind of law. He puts his spirit in God's people. The spirit is poured out upon them. He puts his spirit in them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And now the covenant becomes internalized. And the way God works out his covenant relationship with people is through the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And what we have there, Peter interprets this. He says, oh, this is what Joel said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit. Are we waiting for the last days to take place at some uncertain time in the future when the book of Revelation will be fulfilled? No, the last days started on Pentecost. Hebrews says, God spoke by the prophets, But in these last days, he now speaks through his son. The last days are taking place in the time of the book of Hebrews. And the last days are taking place in the time of the book of Revelation. What it means is that when God changes the way he does things, we have a, an eschatological event, the end of the old, the beginning of the new. I'm positing, I'm suggesting, I've already suggested it these past several weeks, this worldwide pandemic is very significant. The Lord, the Lord is doing this across the globe. Everyone knows about this. God is moving not just in Detroit or New York City or, or New Jersey or the United States. He's moving in Africa. He's moving in Australia. He's moving across all the continents of the earth and saying, I'm putting an end to one way of doing things, and I'm going to start up a new way of doing things. We are experiencing an eschatological event, an end time event. And the book of Revelation, of course, as well as mountain moving faith passages in Jesus help to inform us. When we begin to understand what mountains need to be removed, we'll understand this better. Now, Terrence Donaldson, Okay, he, he has a book called Jesus on the Mountain, A Study in Matthew's Theology. And he lists four kinds of symbols that mountains, uh, biblical symbols, symbols uh, that were uh, common uh, at the, uh, during Second Temple Judaism, which was Jesus' uh, time of existence. There were at least four significant symbols for mountains. First of all, there was the covenant mountain. The holy mountains of the Old Testament are regarded as sacred sites where Yahweh established his covenant relationship with his people. That's what I've already mentioned. Mountains speak of covenants. A second symbol is the cosmic mountain. The mountains, especially Mount Zion, are regarded as points of entry into the heavens. I'm, a mountain it, it symbolizes where heaven and earth touch, where heaven and earth are joined, where heaven and earth meet together, and, and, and hence they're an entry to the heavens. That's perfectly seen in Mount Sinai. The Lord descends from heaven, lands on Mount Sinai, and he touches human existence, human reality. He gives Moses his laws, his commandments. It's also seen in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem on Pentecost, uh, on that, that first Sunday after uh, that, that, that 50-day mark, I should say, after Jesus died, rose from the dead. Ten days after, of course, he ascended to heaven. He was with the disciples for the first 40 days teaching them about the kingdom of God, which we spoke of several weeks ago. And there's another point where heaven touches the earth. The spirit of God is poured out from heaven. Just as God came down and gave his law on Sinai 1,500 years ago, uh, the first Pentecost, now, 1,500 years later, he descends from heaven and pours out his spirit. The third image... Uh, of a mountain is the mountain of revelation. Mountains are sites chosen by God for special revelation. And finally, there's 
the eschatological mountain, which I've, I've mentioned already as well. That's rooted in Old Testament Zion eschatology. Zion stands for uh, something, and Zion is a mountain. Second Temple Judaism, that's the Judaism at the time of Christ, regards holy mountains as sites of eschatological events, supernatural events when God puts one thing to a, an end, brings one thing to its close, and starts something new up, such as Messiah coming and gathering his people, such as the pilgrimages of the Gentiles, all coming up to Mount Zion to hear the word of the Lord, to embrace his law and embrace his covenant and worship him. And also it's the point where the dead are raised, it's resurrection. So, so we have, uh, we have um, some, some significance here, some symbolic, biblical symbolism behind mountains. I want to continue with uh, a few things that that Jung says here, uh, because she's she speaks here of some uh, Old Testament and New Testament examples. She talks about um, the fact that all of the Gospels mention Jesus's mountain removing faith sayings and relate them to holy mountains. Uh, gives us a, a hint at the theological significance of Jesus' saying. If Jesus indeed used mountains as a symbolic or a visual teaching aid because of their importance in Jewish uh, thinking or uh, biblical Hebraic thinking, what could the removal of a mountain, especially the removal of a holy mountain, refer to? Jung says the first point to note is that in the Jewish biblical traditions, mountain removal is often associated with God's mighty acts of salvation and judgment. She talks about in Micah and Nahum and Habakkuk, mountains melt and crumble as God comes to judge Samaria or Jerusalem or the nations. In Zechariah 4, 6, and 7, which we taught on last week, Mountain leveling refers to the building of the second temple and the revival of the nation of Israel. Zechariah talked about the mountain, this mountain of debris that had to be removed from the destroyed first temple site so that the second temple can be rebuilt. There's a, an eschatological image. God ended the first temple. He put his people into exile. There's always repentance before revival. Then he returned them to the land, and they rebuilt a second temple. There's a, also a, a strong eschatological emphasis in God's saving and judging activities that are related in mountain revival in some of the, the major prophets. Isaiah speaks of the new things done by the Lord when he will lay waste the mountains and the hills. That's Isaiah 42, 15. And every mountain and hill shall be made low in 40, verse 4. Ezekiel prophesies about the Lord's vindication of Israel against Gog, the enemy, the ultimate enemy of God's people. Gog. Uh, symbolizes the ultimate enemy of God's people coming to destroy the, the sons of Israel. And this is in a day when mountains will be overturned in Ezekiel 38.20. In Zechariah 14.10, which we mentioned last week, the hill country of Judah from Geba to Rimon will be leveled while Mount Zion will be raised on the future day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, which Isaiah 2 says, the day in which the Lord alone will be exalted and his name will be one. That day of the Lord has to do with, it's an eschatological event when the Lord comes in his glory and the whole world understands that he is Lord. In Zechariah 14, four through five, the split and removal of the Mount of Olives will facilitate the escape of Israel from the capture of the nations. It will precede the coming and final judgment of the Lord. There are also references uh, within the New Testament 
the association of the day of the Lord with mountain removal is picked up in the book of Revelation by John. When God pours his anger on his enemies in the final days, every mountain will be removed from its place. Revelation 6, 14 and 16, 20. Men will call upon mountains to fall upon them so as to hide themselves from the anger of the lamb, the wrath of the lamb in Revelation 6, 15 and 16. This is all in tune with Zion eschatology or the Zion theology of the second temple Judaism when Jesus was alive, which had developed a strong eschatological outlook. On the one hand, the tone is severe. The prophets, especially Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, condemned Israel for violating her covenant obligations and prophesied, prophesied uh, that the Lord God would not spare Zion, the mountain and city of his election and presence. The mountains of Israel representing Israel, the nation, were rejected by God because these high places were defiled by the altars on them. The reason for mountains is to have a connection with God, but that's why the places of idolatry were called the high places, because people would go up onto mountains and they would build idols to false gods. The Lord came down and the mountain should be the place where God's people contact him, the true God, instead they're idols. So this idea of mountain removing or mountain moving faith has to do with the removal of idols in our lives. Hence the word, the theme has been coming from this church and many churches. We need to repent so there can be revival. On the other hand, and where there's repentance and there's the judgment of God removing the idols of the high places, there is revival that follows. On the other hand, there's a comforting note. The prophets look forward to an eschatological renewed and restored Zion, which would ultimately rise above all the mountains. And that's famous passage, Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 4. The same mountains of Israel that Ezekiel denounced would be restored to prosperity in the last days when God comes to judge Israel's enemies, Ezekiel 36, 1 through 12. Finally, we're going to look a little bit of what Jung says uh, in terms of Jesus's statements, his, his mountain removing statements. And she says that um, Jesus would have uttered the mountain removing faith sayings with reference to this, this Old Testament background. And she starts, she starts with Mark eleven twenty three 23 and Matthew 21, 21. I want to read her comments, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll go into those passages and begin to teach. She says that in Mark eleven twenty three 23 and the parallel passage in Matthew 21, 21, uh, Jesus' is saying makes better sense when interpreted against the Jewish tradition of linking eschatological judgment, putting the end to one thing through judgment, and eschatological deliverance, salvation, with mountain removal. In saying that faith can remove this mountain. Now, three of the sayings, Jesus actually says, your faith can remove this mountain. And twice the context uh, is uh, this mountain would be uh, Jerusalem, Zion, the, 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 the group of mountains there surrounding Jerusalem. And then in, in Matthew 17, this mountain would be the Mount Hermon, the mountain of uh, Jesus's transfiguration. She says that uh, in saying that faith can remove this mountain, Jesus is actually speaking of a faith that appropriates God's will, calls upon God to judge unbelief in the people of God, particularly represented by the Jewish religious leaders who rejected Jesus as Messiah and hurl the covenant mountain into the sea. 
Now that's some background from Jung, and, and we need to understand this. Mountain removing faith, the large image behind it has to do with the removal of everything that hinders the revelation of Jesus, the outpouring of his spirit to establish covenant relationship in his people. It has to do with removing idolatry in our lives. It has to do with changing the way we do church to become more consistent with obedience to the Lord. So if we're going to have the real kind of mountain moving faith that that scripture speaks of, then what we need to do is we need to recognize the hindrances to mountain moving faith. Now here, here's something we'll see as we look uh, at some of the details in these passages, but here, here's what we need to understand. How does God create mountain moving faith within us? In other words, when, when we look at these passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what will we see in those passages where Jesus encourages us to have mountain moving faith or to get mountain moving faith, or even from the standpoint of Luke, that we already have mountain moving faith. What will Jesus suggest is his modus operandi for us to get mountain moving faith. That, that's what we want, that's what we need. Now you have to understand when you're reading the various gospels, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we could include John in this, even though we don't have any specific references to mountain moving faith in John, is that the way the disciples are characterized by the writers of the gospels are different. Mark and Matthew, in general, have a, uh, a, a negative perspective on the disciples. The disciples are, are cast in, a, in a, a negative slant in Matthew and Mark. Luke, by and large, has a more positive slant on the disciples. It's, it's, it's almost as if to say Matthew and Mark are like, come on, you guys, you're walking in unbelief. You need to repent. You need to be obedient. You need to get on with this. Where Luke is, hey, guys, you got this faith. You got this. You can handle this. Let's do it. Let's walk in it. And it's because uh, that the, the, the various authors, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have a, a, a different theme that they're using the gospel of Jesus uh, to develop in terms of discipleship. Matthew's, Matthew is a key, key book on discipleship. And so the, the discipleship that he's emphasizing in there points out frequently the flaws of the disciples. Mark is, Mark is very simply, let God be true and every man a liar. Mark is interested in the disciples seeing Jesus, seeing his awesome power, his lordship, how desperate they are, how, how ungodly they are, how far they are from the mark, how, how much they need Jesus's help. Luke is about, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do anything. He, his emphasis is on the power of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of the disciples. So, so let me say this in terms of how we disciple. My friend Rick Ludlow did a, I've quoted this to my church many times, did kind of a, a little um, unofficial, uh, semi-scientific evaluation of the Gospels. And what he did in the Gospels was he looked at the sayings of Jesus. He looked at the sayings of Jesus and he analyzed the sayings of Jesus 
was some, something Jesus said positive or something Jesus said negative. And when, when he tallied up the references, two of every three things Jesus says are negative. He emphasizes repentance. One of every three is positive. It's, it's affirming. And that's perfectly seen in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark and Matthew have a negative view of the disciples. Luke has a, Luke has a positive view. That's why so much of our culture right now works against the word of the Lord. Oh, you said something negative to me. How terrible that is. How terrible you are. And yet that's exactly how Jesus discipled when you look at the collective whole. Two out of three repentance, one out of three revival. We need to repent so that there might be revival. Now, looking at this, this difference, actually, Luke's saying about the sycamore tree moving faith as opposed to the mountain moving faith, I wanted to add it in there as one of the four because Luke's is like, you guys can do this. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You've got the Holy Spirit. Come on, guys, let's do that. Where Jesus' sayings in Matthew and Mark are, are, are more rebukes. So let's take a look at Mark 11, 23. We'll look at that one first. Now, in the overall structure of Mark, when compared with the structure in Matthew, the events are not in the same order. This, this, this particular passage, uh, both from Mark 11 and Matthew 21, they're, they're parallel passages, but they, they really have aspects of mountain moving faith that differ from each other, but they're structured differently in terms of the order of the events. See, one of the things we, we have to realize about the way ancient authors wrote, if, if we say, well, gosh, Matthew put it in this order, he put the, he put the, uh, entry into Jerusalem, the cleansing of the temple, then the cursing of the fig tree, in that order. But Mark puts the entry into Jerusalem, cursing of the fig tree, it, and, and the cleansing of the temple is embedded into the middle of the cursing of the fig tree, and it makes the cursing of the fig tree into like two events a coming into the city event, a, and, and a return to the city event, and the cleansing of the temple is in the middle. Oh my gosh, it's a contradiction. The Bible contradicts itself. It doesn't contradict itself. The order of events does not have to be strictly laid out in the gospel narratives. We think in, in, in our modern Western thought, we think in a linear fashion. The, 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 the Hebraic culture, an Eastern culture, they weren't concerned about the actual linear events as much as what was the theological significance of this. Now, there, there could be events that are, 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 are put in different places because there were two events that, that were similar. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying we can't do a kind of a, a, a gospel chronology, but they're making a theological point. They're making a theological point. So the cleansing of the temple by Jesus in Mark 11 is embedded in the midst of the, the fig tree being cursed. We'll look at the details more. I'm just pointing it out uh, right now. We'll look at the details more uh, next time. Keep in mind the symbolism of the fig tree. Go with me back to Zechariah. Keep your hand in Mark 11 because we're going to go there. But go back to Zechariah chapter 3 last week. In Zechariah 3, there is a reference to every man being under uh, his vine and his fig tree. Zechariah chapter 3. Let me get there. This was in the prophetic word and the vision that was given to Joshua the high priest 
one of the two re main uh, forces in the rebuilding of the temple, along with Zerubbabel, uh, the governor, as, as well as the, the persons of the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. Zechariah 3.8 says, Listen, O high priest Joshua, and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. The priesthood was symbolic of things to come. The governmental structure was symbolic of things to come. That was embodied in Zerubbabel. Haggai and Zechariah embodied the prophetic. They were symbols of things to come. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. Now, the priests are going to cooperate with the servant, the branch, the messianic figure, the son of David. That's Zerubbabel, the governor. And then this stone that we talked about last week. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it. says the Lord Almighty, the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. So it's a day of atonement picture. On the day of atonement, once a year, all the sins of Israel are removed in a single day. And so the priesthood performing its function, which was to do what? To teach the people how to worship God and to teach the people how to be in fellowship with God. And atonement from sin is an aspect of teaching God's people how to worship and, and how to be uh, in, in fellowship with him. And in this day, when sin is removed, in that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit down and fellowship under his vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. Now, this image of fellowshipping together, sitting under the vine and the fig tree, it pictures fellowship with God when sin is removed, fellowship with each other. The vine and the fig tree speak of God blessings to Israel. It speaks of fruitfulness. It speaks of inheritance. It speaks of prosperity. It speaks of, of, of uh, nutrition. It speaks of provision. It speaks of being fed and rejoicing before the Lord. And of course, the third image is this not only fellowship with, man, with God, but fellowship with man in peace everyone having access to the blessings of God. So the fig tree stood for an Israel whose sins were forgiven, who were in fellowship with God, who were in fellowship with each other, who were all enjoying equal peace and equal access to the blessings of the Lord. So when, when Jesus comes upon the fig tree, on his way to Jerusalem in the Holy Week, remember this all took place in the final week between Jesus's triumphal entry and, and he would be crucified uh, that weekend. As he comes in and he sees the fig tree with no fruit, he curses the fig tree. And basically he says, the way things are supposed to be in Israel, every man inviting his neighbor, in the fellowship, in the prosperity and wholeness and peace and blessing and vines and fig trees with great amount of fruit, it's not taking place. And so Jesus curses the fig tree. More on that next week. Then in Mark, he cleanses the temple. The, the cleansing of the temple, the temple stood for worship. The temple stood for prayer. My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, is what Jesus says in Mark eleven seventeen. And it wasn't being utilized for that. It wasn't being utilized for worship. It wasn't being utilized for prayer. It wasn't being utilized for fellowship. There was no fruit. Worship was being hindered. And Jesus overturns the money tables. He overturns the commerce. He overturns the consumerism. Something had taken place in Israel. Religion, the, the true religion of the Jews, covenant relationship with Yahweh, had now turned into pure consumerism, buying and selling. Pure consumerism, other agendas, idolatry that hindered true worship. 
this is the context within which Jesus is going to say, if you say to this mountain. And he's making reference to the, the cleansing of the, of the temple on the temple mountain. So if we, if we pick up in verse 20 of Mark 11, and in the morning while passing by, the disciples saw the fig tree that Jesus cursed dried up from its roots. When Peter remembered this, he said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you curse has dried up. Now, I want you to understand they're impressed with the miraculous dimension here. And, and Jesus is, is going to call us to, to, to mountain-moving faith, which is faith for miracles. But Jesus is not impressed with the miracle itself. He's impressed with the theology that the miracle is illustrating. And this is what we need to see about mountain moving faith. It's not simply faith for miracles. It's faith for miracles that remove all impediments to God's purposes being fulfilled. And God's purposes is at his temple, the place where his presence dwells and where his people gather in unity with him and each other is being hindered. It's being hindered by a religious system that is contrary to God's purposes. This is, this, is, this is where Israel found itself at the time of Christ. And it found itself there at the time of Christ, a religion so contrary to the purposes of God that the Messiah, whom they'd been waiting for for 1,400 years, who'd been prophesied all throughout Scripture, when the Messiah came, they actually reject him. They do more than reject him. They don't see him because they don't see him. They reject him and they actually put him to death. This is how far out of whack the system was. And these are God's people using scripture, invoking God's spirit, worshiping and praying, fasting, doing all of these things that they were prescribed to do outwardly, but their hearts were far from the Lord. When the Lord comes eschatologically to dismantle, he dismantles the current system and establishes a new system. He dismantles the heavens and the earth, the way the mountains of Israel are functioning, they have idols on them instead of being places of contact with the living God. He replaces, he picks that mountain up and casts it into the sea and then establishes a new mountain. If, and this, this, this is Mike Osminski suggesting, but I, am, I, I myself am persuaded in my heart that this is true and that this is what I've been prepared for for 50 years in Christ was this hour, Mike Osminski is suggesting that the purpose of this pandemic is the Lord's got the church, the church in the whole world. He's got a hold of us and he's saying, I need to dismantle the way things are going in my body. And I, I, I need to see that my house is a house of worship, that it's for worship, that it's for intercessory prayer, that it's for relationship between people and their God, that God's people are in relationship with each other, that is unity, and that the mountain that needs to be cast into the sea, it needs to be removed and hurled into the sea with mountain moving faith, is the miraculous faith needed to say, we need to stop buying and selling on the Temple Mount. We need to stop using Christ as a cloak for our sin. We need to stop using Jesus to justify my way of life. We need to stop Jesus, stop using Jesus as a means for my end, my ends, and let Jesus speak to us and cause us to pick up our cross and follow after him. We need desperately, and this is what mountain moving faith is, we need to go up to the mountains, the high places, and remove the idols that are in our lives and see true worship established. Peter's impressed with that. 
But in verse 22, Jesus answered and said to them, and this is very important. Now, many translations translate this next phrase as what we would call an objective genitive. An objective genitive would be translated, have faith in God. That, that, that what's being stated in this passage is that we need to have faith in God. We, we need to remove our faith in, in, in human systems and transfer them to God. And I have no problem with that translation. I mean, I'm going to, I'm, I translate this as a subjective genitive, which would translate it different. But to me, uh, it's, it's, there's a minimal difference between the objective and the subjective. I just think the subjective genitive brings out a, a deeper truth, but the, the, the end point is all the same. We need to look to God. We need to look to God and walk in faith to remove the mountains to cooperate with the lord in what he's doing in the earth in this hour and for the church to get it right for the church to hear god for the church to turn to god for the church to repent for the lord to send his spirit to send a a, a revelation of the messiah and if there's been any areas in any of us where we're rejecting the messiah and using the messiah for 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 our own emotional desires our own personal agendas then 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 we need to cease doing that an objective genitive says have faith in god but the but the the the, the construction, the grammatical construction there, the syntax can also be a subjective genitive, which means have the faith of God, have God's faith, have God-like faith. He's saying, this is what you need, disciples, right now, because, see, Jesus is foreshadowing in his mountain uh, removing faith statements that, see, Jerusalem is going to be judged. In 70 AD, some, some, some 40 years after this saying, after prophesying in Luke 21 and Mark 13 and Matthew 24 that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, it happened. And it was God's way of removing the mountain of a false religious system that took the things of God and used the things of God for their own personal agendas. And Jesus says, the way you're going to do this, the way you're going to get through this, the way you're going to be able to say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, is have God-like faith. Have the faith of God. Let the faith of God flow through you. Let the faith, let the faith of God be a conduit through you. Now remember, this is Mark's gospel. Mark's view of the disciples is, 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 is fairly negative. And, but his reason for negative is that where Luke might say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Mark would say, you can't do anything without God. And you need him desperately. And you need to understand how desperately you need him. What hinders repentance in the churches, we really don't understand how desperately we need God. And, and, and for whatever reason we don't repent, we, 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 the, the basis, according to Mark, is that we don't understand how desperately we need him. To say to a mountain, be removed, be picked up, be lifted up, removed, and cast in the sea, that's impossible by human standards. Jesus is calling us to an impossible standard. He's calling us to, to something that we, in and of ourselves, do not have the ability to perform. And Mark is saying, go have God's faith. Let the faith of God flow through you. And for the faith of God to flow through us, we need to hear God. We need to respond to God. We need to obey God. We need to embrace God. We need to see God. We need to love God. We need to open ourselves completely to God for the mountain-moving faith of God to flow through us. So 
and this this will be the, the the only one of the four that that we'll look at this week. We'll we'll look at uh, the others next week. This has nothing to do with us and has everything to do with God. If we want mountain moving faith, then we need to immerse ourselves in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, their word and their gospel. We need to immerse ourselves. And see, in, 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 in our culture, we have a number of high places that hinder us from immersing ourselves in God. See, see, we're consumers in the temple, just as the, the money changers were, just as the priests were, just as the scribes were, everybody involved. The priests were involved in this. They were the ones who were supposed to teach God's people how to worship. They were immersed in individual agendas, idolatry. The scribes and the Pharisees were to teach God's people God's word but they had a distorted slant on the word because of their own agendas. The, the scribes were the legal experts. They're, they're the ones that, that sit down and say, no, 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 you must do this. You must not do this. Scripture says, and, and scripture will not budge on this point. You must do this and you must do that. When Jesus talked about whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatsoever you loose on earth and you loose in heaven, that was primarily a scribal function. To bind was to hold someone accountable to the scripture. You must do this, and if you don't, you're in trouble. To loose them was to say, we're going to loose you of this responsibility. We're going to bring forgiveness, and we're going to loose it. The scribes, though, even though they had that authority, were misusing it. Priests, scribes, money changers in the temple, and they're all performing tasks that are needed to worship God, but they, they what drove them was not the faith of God. They had there, there, there were idols in the high places. Let me suggest idols that we have. In America, our nation can be an idol. Our families can be an idol. Our personal, emotional well-being can be an idol. Wealth can be an idol. Power can be an idol. Wanting to be somebody can be an idol. Leisure time can be an idol. So many things can be idols. Our health can be an idol. We have to ascend the high places in this hour. And this is why the Lord has things shut down. May I say, last February, I said, hey, next year's our 50th year. I think the Lord spoke to me. I, I said this at the Fisherman's Net first. On the first Sunday in February in 2019, I said, you know, it's going to be 50 years for the for the, the Jesus movement in, 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 in Detroit, on the east side of Detroit. And it's going to be our 50th year, and it's going to be the year of Jubilee. And, you know, I was teaching, and everybody's excited because you look at all the benefits of the year of Jubilee, all the blessings that are poured forth from the year of Jubilee, except everything was supposed to be shut down for a year in the year of Jubilee. And in a year of shutdown, God's people were to repent. God's people were to trust God for provision. God's people were to bless the poor and the oppressed. God's people was, well, uh, God's people's purpose was to release oppression and bondage from people, but everything was shut down. Everything was closed down. Wow. Who would have thought year 50, it had, it had been this kind of a shutdown. But keep in mind, the year of Jubilee was supposed to take place every 50 years in the history of Israel. Do you know there is not one single occurrence in the Old Testament where the book of Jubilee was actually celebrated? In other words, the laws, the celebration, the enactment of the year of Jubilee never took place. So then the Lord says, oh, well, and, and he gave them. He gave them, um, he actually gave them uh, 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 10 uh, 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 sets of Jubilee years, which would, which would come out to 490 years. He gave them 490 years to keep one Jubilee, and they didn't. 
And so what did the Lord do? He shut the land down, not by choice, but by force, and exiled God's people in Babylon. And so they had a 70-year exile lockdown so that the land could rest, so that God's people could stop their idolatrous behavior and get right with God. Hmm. Could this be uh, some of the rationale behind the pandemic? Those people want to get this thing over quickly and over fast. Well, that's in God's hands, brethren. That's in God's hands. I believe the Lord has given us a chance here to deal with the idols in our lives. Wow. I'm certainly in lockdown. I'm seeing a whole lot of idols in my life. It's called the American way of life. I'm seeing a whole lot of idols in my way of life. And my wife alluded to some in the, in the communion message. So let's, let's, let's uh, conclude here in Mark. And Jesus answering said to them, have the faith of God. Have, have God-like faith. Let it flow through you. Now, if your translation says have faith in God and that makes more sense to you, I'm okay with that. A translation is just that. It's a translation. And sometimes uh, multiple translations uh, serve multiple purposes. I am not like those people who say, we've got to find that one right translation of the Bible. That's, I say, let's look at 10 translations. Let's look at 15 translations. Let's understand what the text is saying. There's no one-to-one -one parallel moving from one language to another. You cannot perfectly reproduce Hebrew in English or Greek in English. You can't do it. It's it's just there's it that doesn't work. That's that's why the Lord confused the languages at the Tower of Babel. He doesn't want there to be one translation, and he doesn't want there to be one voice. The one voice is the voice of the Lord, and the voice of the Lord, when he speaks. He shatters the rock in 70 pieces, which means a single rock, which stands for a single concept, can be translated 70 different ways. Chew on that one for a while. Jesus says, have God-like faith. Amen. For I say unto you that whosoever says to this mountain, and it's the mountain where the worship the true worship of God in prayer is being hindered by religious ways of thinking that are not consistent with biblical ways of thinking. That's what revelation really is. It's learning how to see things God's way. That's what the renewing of the mind is. God taking us out of our own subjective patterns of thinking and revealing the way he sees things, the way he does things. For I say unto you that whoever says to this mountain, be taken up, be lifted up, and cast into the sea, and does not doubt it in his heart, but believes that the things which he says are coming to pass, he shall have whatever he says. And see, that's how you know you have the sign of, of, of God-like faith in your spirit, because you're just, uh, you're, you're assured that you're walking in God's authority because you're seeking to fulfill his will. That's the source of mountain moving faith. I'm in his will. Whatsoever I ask will be granted unto me. John says that. Jesus the uh, Jesus in John, John's gospel says, if you ask anything in my name. See, that's the key. It doesn't say ask anything you want or anything you think or everything you believe is is what you deserve or this is the way God should work it out. When you ask it in his name, you stand in the place that he stood and he was the son who only did what he saw his father doing. He was the son who only spoke what he heard his father say. That's what it means to pray in Jesus's name in the gospel of John. So what Jesus is saying is get right with God, align yourself with God's purposes, align yourself with God's kingdom, align yourself with God's spirit, align yourself with God's Messiah. And when you do, God's authority will be released in you to say mountain be cast in the sea. And remember, at least in this one mountain moving faith passage, it has to do with removing idols that keep us from worshiping God. Could, could, could we stop blaming other people? 
for the things that have happened in our lives? Can we stop blaming the devil? Can we stop uh, uh, blaming circumstances and people? And uh, if, if only this would have happened, if only that would have happened, can we stop doing that and look to the Lord? Look to the Lord and say, I just, Lord, I don't, I don't, I, it doesn't matter to me who or what is to blame. I want to stand in line, in alignment with your will and your purposes. I want to see your will and your purposes be established in the earth. And see, that's what frees us from doubt. That's what frees us from confusion. That's what frees us from unbelief. And, and finally, Jesus says, and we'll close in, in uh, verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. We start with prayer. Prayer is a two-way street. We talk to God and he talks to us. And as we pray, God his presence, his purposes, his will begin to shape and form what we ask. And it creates mountain moving faith within us. And we can say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. We ask you, Lord our God, give us mountain moving faith. Help us, Lord, to remove the ice from our lives and to establish your kingdom purposes in our lives, Lord. Lord, we're in uh, lockdown, exile, uh, jubilee, Sabbath rest, oh God. May we worship you and be obedient to you in this, and then we will see the blessings that the jubilee intended to bring. Follow this this difficult time lord this time of lockdown but lord even if 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 repentance is reconfiguring the way we see things and reconfiguring the way we look at things even if we can see lord god this pandemic through your eyes that as difficult as horrible as traumatic as tragic as this has already been we can still see your hand at work in this, Lord. We will see and have and gain access to your blessings when this is over. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Pastor Jan is going to close us out in prayer. I'll do a brief announcements and uh, and we'll, we'll send you on your way. God bless you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Well, it's been uh, an enlightening morning. I just learned so much that I didn't know before. Um, and I'm praying that, um, you know, what's nice about these live casts is that you can go back and play it over. And that's probably what I'm going to do. There's a lot of nuggets in what Pastor shared, and I want to um, re-listen to it. So, dear Lord, we just thank you for this this jubilee, Lord. Um, we would not have asked for this. We would have wanted it a different way. But you are the supreme God. You are the all-knowing one who decides with your knowledge what we really need, Lord. And so in this hour, dear God, may we rise to the occasion. May we spread the good news. May we seek your face and read your word, Lord. Help us to be more than we thought we ever could be, Lord. Let us destroy the idols in our lives. Tear down whatever that you shine on and let us re see the revelation, Lord, and destroy those idols, dear God. Hallelujah. Amen.
Okay, just a few announcements uh, for uh, the conclusion of the service. We will continue to hold the Bible study uh, from 10 to 10.50 a.m. every Sunday, and we will have our service at 11, and we'll still be live streaming until, uh, until uh, circumstances change and uh, we're released uh, by the Lord to go back and start holding live services. Tithes and offerings, again, you can send them to, uh, you can go directly to Lord of the Harvest's website, which is LHCF, L as in Lord, H as in Harvest, C as in Christian, F as in Fellowship, LHCF War in one word, um, uh, and uh, backslash support, that's on our website, and you can do a PayPal offering, or you can mail the check directly to the church. And that is uh, mail the, make out the check to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship, P.O. Box 26505, Fraser, Michigan, 48026. Um, we are keeping our food pantry open two days a week. We're open on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 9 a.m. till 11 a.m. Uh, I just, I really want to appreciate uh, that we are, we are, we have been getting donations uh, for our food pantry and for the church uh, from just uh, people that don't go to Lord of the Harvest, but just have really had a burden to assist us and keep that food pantry open. We, Lord, we, we pray for our food pantry workers, everybody who's volunteering, that you just watch over them and protect them. Uh, from COVID-19, Lord, we, we also pray for our neighborhood, Lord, that you watch over uh, people and bless them in the name of Jesus. But it's, it's, been, it's been just wonderful how, um, how uh, people from the outside just continue to assist us in our keeping our food pantry open. Uh, we also have during the week, every, every Thursday night, every Thursday, we have a corporate prayer meeting on Zoom. It runs from 7 to 8, but sometimes we run till 8.30 uh, because we, we, we have uh, a lot of people who really are praying and are, are praying powerfully. Uh, our next Thursday night corporate prayer by Zoom format will be uh, this coming Thursday, April the 30th. You need to email LHCF, Lord Harvest Christian Fellowship, LHCF1 at Comcast.net to request an invite. You have to have an invite to a Zoom meeting. So if you're interested in participating in that prayer meeting, uh, email. Uh, and my dog is saying amen, apparently. Um, we also have an every other week Bible study, Kingdom Education. And Kingdom Education, the next Kingdom Education will be on May the 6th. That will not be this Wednesday, but a week from this Wednesday. It runs from 6.15 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, Pastor Bird is teaching that. And, again, that's a Zoom invite, so you need to email uh, Lord of the Harvest in order to get, uh, get that invite by email. Tonight, we are having our monthly AWE corporate prayer gathering, again, by Zoom meeting format. Uh, all the churches in uh, Warren uh, that are involved in the Alliance of Warren Evangelical gather once a month, and we pray from 6 to 7.30. We pray for an hour and a half for the needs for our city, for our state, for our country, for the church. And again, we will be going online Zoom at 6 p.m. If, if, if you want an invite, to that meeting tonight and you have not yet gotten an invite, uh, please email lhcf1 at comcast.net uh, for that. And I believe that covers uh, the, the main announcement. So thank you, Lord, for this time together. Be with us, Lord, as we go forth and do the work of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. May your people be encouraged to follow after you in these times. Amen.